you guys are going to be loving this episode. You guys are going to be getting a history lesson. There's got to be a lot of name dropping going on, but we're going to start with the guy who we have with us today. My man, James Mims, the creator of Mims Bands. Dude, thank you so much for hopping on. Keep swinging, brother. No, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think that a lot of people, when they hear your story and they they learn about what you do and, and your background, they're just going to be just taken back. And I admire you as a friend, as as a creator, and as somebody who's been in baseball for so long. So just just give a little bit of background and 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 just share with us what exactly Mims bands are for anybody who's unfamiliar with them. And if you are familiar with them, you know that there's a good chance that one of your favorite players has probably worn them at one point or another. Uh, yep, it's a it's a product that I developed in 1980, 85, 1986 while I was uh, studying in college and I didn't want to go into corporate America. So I immediately, I wore wristbands high school and college. And I had an idea that I took to Dusty who I had known, man, since I was like 12, 10, 12 years old. And my, my godfather, Jim Gilliam, uh, who's roommates with Jackie Robinson when he played with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, Rookie of the year in 1953. That's how I met Dusty. So um, Dusty was with the A's at the time. So I showed him the idea that I had. He liked it. It looked a little strange because it was hand done. It wasn't embroidered at the time. And uh, conceptually, he liked it. And basically, it's a it's wristbands that depicts the ball player's likeness and autograph on them. And he was the first one to wear them. And he kind of referred me to some of his guys and. You know, over 130 players later, voila, it's 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 starting to come mainstream now, but it wasn't before. They were on a bunch of baseball cars. No one knew where they could get them. They saw them. I mean, it was a, it was a who's who of uh, the players. I mean, like truly like a who's who. Yeah. And even the roster to this day, like you said, 130 plus players. And it, it seems like it just continues to grow. And I know a lot of people probably saw with the Tops project uh, that just came out in 2021 and and going into 2022 man you got your own baseball card this year with a lot of your work and and just showing some of these players and just recreating some of the cards and again you show these players face on the wristband and it's just so cool because i know so many people within the game whether it's the players or, or just like fans in general who just absolutely love them so it's just so cool to hear how it started and, and and that connection with Dusty Baker, man. So how old were you when you did approach him? I know you said that it was like probably like what in your like teenage years or, or you were playing baseball and you wanted the wristbands, but like, were you nervous? Were you uh, afraid or were you excited that you got some sort of product that could be such a game changer and so innovative like yourself because nobody was doing it at the time and still pretty much nobody's doing it. It's, it's just so unique. That's a good question. That's one I've never been asked. Was I nervous? No, because the relationship was established. Um, I've been blessed to be around Major League Clubhouses, man, since the age of 10. So I really wasn't like, I'm not your typical fan. So I never, ever say that. Um, I knew that if I did my homework and I would go prepared um, with something that I felt um he would go for because Dusty was truly the first one to kind of cross over he was the first one to like wear uh or use Mizuno gloves where it wasn't he went against Rawlings so he was the first one to rock Mizuno's uh baseball gloves in the United States and that was taboo because it was Japanese owned company so I knew he was he was going to be a for, um, he was going to have forethought so I wasn't nervous it was more about would the players go for it more than nervous? I knew conceptually it was cool, but I was like, man, who's going to, you know, like who's going to wear it? I was more nervous about that than anything. And you picked the right person too, to do this with like, at least approach Dusty Baker. Cause we've heard so many great stories about how he's just, just an awesome dude. I only had the yeah. privilege to meet him a couple of times and hang out with him, but he just kind of, even though it was at, at least our first time when we met, I felt yeah. like, like, he was an uncle, like we had known each other for so long. He's just that type of dude. And then yeah. you hear stories from other players like Kenny Lofton, who I just recorded with. He was on the show and he was telling stories about how he was the best manager that he ever played for. And if he knew that a player liked something, 
he would either bring it to the stadium for him, like uh, 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 David Bell, the dude loved catfish. So he went to, so Dusty Baker went to a, a local restaurant in the city that they were playing in and surprised him with catfish at his locker that day. Like that's the type of dude that Dusty Baker is. So mm -hmm. the fact that he was the guy who you first approach, I mean, it takes a leader to to show other people how to become leaders and you became a leader in just this 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 cool product and 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 doing something com different you know and you didn't reinvent the wheel you just had right. something that was a need and that was cool and that people mm -hmm. loved and gravitated towards right you're right that's i mean how kenny described him that's how he was when i first he introduced himself to me that's that was i mean i never had that happen and he's very, um, when he locks into you, he locks into you, where he can get the maximum out of you. So for him to, and I've seen him do, I've been to the stadiums with him where he went to go pick up meals, oh, you know, for Charlie Hayes or for Eric Davis or for Sean Dunstan or any of those guys. He knew exactly what they wanted, and he was able to get the max out of every guy that he dealt with. So I felt like, you're right. He was a perfect guy, not not knowing then that he was. But as I look back on it, I mean, he opened up his Rolodex to me. I mean, guys who were his friends forever. I mean, the first guy he turned me on to was uh, Andre Dawson. Oh, so I see. There's this is one of the first name drops for the listener. Everybody at home is is probably just like, damn, Hall of Famer. Boom. Right. Put it, up, put, it, put it on the list. Let's get it going. Yep. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's check that one off. And then the guy who I felt like should be in the Hall of Fame, who I knew since I was 10 years old, was Bill Buckner. That was another one. And he was the second guy to wear them. And then it just kind of went on and on and on from there. But we'll get into the names and different stories if that come about. But um, one of a kind. I feel like I'm, I know that I'm one of one. And I feel like the product is is unique it is it is stood the test of time and it continues to like intrigue this newer generation you hit the nail on the head man it, it stood the test of time so how many years has this been exactly and and, and I, again it's going to keep on growing because you see so many players now wearing them it's going it's it'll be 38 years i know when i say that out loud i'm thinking that's a long time. And only now is it really starting to garner some recognition. And I tell everyone that DMs me or sends me an email or anything is that, man, like, how did you, like, endure? And that's just part of my, um, that's just part of my DNA. That's how, you know, that's how I was raised. To six, when you believe in something, you have to stick to it. You can't let anyone tell you anything different because now you're doing something for someone else as opposed for yourself. So, yes. And I asked you that question because I want everybody to hear how long this process has taken. And just again, because I admire you so much just for the consistency, the perseverance and, 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 and so many times people, if, if it doesn't work overnight or if it doesn't work in three months, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It could be baseball, your, 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 your work, your business, the people just give up so easily. And right. it's just such a testament at the time of this recording and, and what we have going on in the near future with you and, and, and baseball. It just, it's just a great reflection of, of, of your dedication to it. So if you're out there listening to this, listen to James, man. Like, again, it may not take 30 years. It may not take 20 years. It, it may not, it may happen overnight. It may not happen overnight. Even if it does, you still, no matter what, have to keep on plugging away the same exact way that James has because yeah you never know but like you said as long as you stay true to yourself and just keep on pushing forward and 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 keep that idea and that that property and that baby or whatever you want to call it yours right. great things could happen absolutely I, I couldn't agree more I rambled and a little bit um, but like dude like yeah. it's it's so true man you are literally the perfect example of of that and and it, it, you fit keep swinging perfectly yeah you have to it hasn't been easy. It's tested every part of my um, ooh, patience, for sure. Um, there has been some trials and tribulations. Um, but I, I just, like, again, I just stuck with it. And I feel like 
this year is going to be epic. So uh, during this entire 30 plus years, uh, you, obviously there's some highs and lows and, and also too, when it comes to sports leagues and it seems like even more so now it's just, there's just like so many rules or whatever. Like we had Chris Dickerson on founder of players for the planet. And we talked about wanting to make MLB stadiums more environmentally friendly, but it's not as simple as putting in a, a, a filtration water fountain because Dasani owns all the water or something like that. And the filtration system is not Dasani. Just so many different things. You think it'd be so much easier than it actually is. But like, what was it that kept you so focused throughout nearly 40 years of, of, of this product and, and just always believe in yourself? Because like, again, like we're talking like we're not talking like creating uh, like knitting or anything like that. We're talking like dealing with leagues, dealing with teams, dealing with a bunch of millionaires. So like what what exactly was it that kind of kept you focused that entire time and, and just kept on like having you like just run through those walls? When I um, when I started getting the players that I had, I knew that I had something because what they're not going to do is give you time if they don't feel it's a viable product or you're not a viable person. That, that, that was it, Matthew. So when that roster started growing, I'm talking, you know, your Eric Davises, I'm talking your, your Barry Bonds, I'm talking your Gary Sheffields, I'm talking your Barry Larkins, I'm talking Frank Tom. I mean, the list kept going and going. I'm thinking, I, you know, there's something to this. That's what allowed me to, to stand firm because I knew I had the roster. So I'm thinking, how can these other companies get put on? They don't even, they can't even match my roster. Like I, I wasn't understanding it. And it was on every baseball card. And if you go back and look from the late eighties to like the two thousands, there's not a baseball card that you, you wouldn't see that you couldn't find a wristband. I mean, not find a wristband on one of the cards. Magazine so, covers also, man. I'll, uh, I'll never forget everything. some of those Sports Illustrated covers. Right. So and I was a young like kid, too. Like, think about that. Like, I remember that as a kid. See, when you think of, and, and think about that, how could it not be talked about in mainstream? I, I wasn't understanding it. They would zoom in on the camera. I would be watching Game of the Week or whatever. They would say nothing about the wristband. It, 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 like, it was, it, you can't miss it. So I wasn't understanding it. So I felt that in in the in the craziest thing, Matthew, is that I reached out to Tops in 1985. Uh, I sent them a letter saying, "Hey, I would love to be part of Tops. I would love to have the you know the kids send in the rappers, and then they can get a a Mims band if they send in the rapper plus five ninety five or whatever it was." And they sent me a Dear John letter. <laughs> so, you know, again, so the thing here, like, yeah, like here I am, 30 plus years later, designing car shop. That's the crazy part. Yeah. No. Oh, man. So selfishly, I, I'm listening to you say this and I'm thinking about some of the people who I don't know who I've asked to be on this show or, or have done certain things with or even like applying for a job, right? Like you get out of college, you want to work for a certain place, you get the nod may not happen at that point, but it can happen later on. So it's yeah. always just important to keep those good relationships and also to keep on trying to like to keep swinging, man. Like you kept on going at tops, you kept on trying and, and yeah, it didn't happen in the eighties, but it happened in 2021. It's going to continue to happen. So like for everybody listening to this, it's, this isn't just some sort of baseball sports story or, or like product type thing. This is just, this is a entrepreneur at his finest, a creator at his finest. You were so ahead of the game. It took, it took Major League Baseball until, what was it, Players Weekend? What was that, 2017, I think it was, right? Or 2018 right. or 19 or something like that, right? To, yeah. <laughs> until 2017 to finally give players a, a way to express their personality and making it okay without any sort of color percentage rules or, or things that they had to follow in order for yeah. them to show their personality through their cleats, through their bats, through all this type of stuff. So when it comes to showing your personality, you were, I, I don't know, honestly, just off the top of my head, I don't know anybody else who created something and players wore that could actually show their personality outside the MIMS bands. 
when you really Nothing. think about it, right? Like you right. could have the no batting gloves, you could have the cool eye black, but like it's it's literally the Mims bands was the one thing. So you were way ahead of your time. Did you have any idea that you were kind of creating this idea that was so forward thinking? I did. I knew that I wanted to. Uh, Dude, my God, cheers. Let's go. Show personality of these players. I knew then that I wanted the individualism because everything was so cookie cutter. I mean, nothing was unique. I mean, zero. And one of the things that Dusty told me is there was nothing barring the players from wearing themselves. You know, it's not like it's a, it's a competitive product at all. It was the player. And who better to have on a product than the player? You're advertising yourself. You're not advertising the company, um, you know, any of those companies. This is you. I, I didn't feel like anyone would. I wasn't sure if anyone was going to say yes, but I knew that someone was not going to look at it and say, oh, that's kind of forward thinking. Let me try it. And when I'm telling you, man, when that roster started growing, and these guys started looking at themselves and acting like kids when they got them. Dude, it was mind blowing. I mean, grown men like, where am I? Did I get where's mine? Did I get, like, unbelievable. So, I feel like I'm the godfather of swag. That's what a title that was given to me by Bob Nightingale. <laughs> I love that. I, I'm going to call yep. you that from now on. I've been called like the NC2A. Really, it should it should be called the Mims Band Rule because all that they're allowing these youngsters to do now is to advertise themselves. Well, I did that way back in 1985, 86 with no internet, no nothing. Can you imagine the internet then? Yeah. With that lineup? And you did it all in good nature too and, and solely off of relationships. Like this is this is not, again, this is nothing cookie cutter. This is just a, a good dude trying to have fun, trying to do well with others and, and, and grow something that you love, the game of baseball and, and just and, and try to help them. You know, it's a right. conversation point. It, it shows, again, it shows their personalities. So you you talk about the roster and just kind of being blown away as it was growing. And uh, I've experienced something kind of similar because, as you know, like I know a lot of guys in baseball, but I, I'd be lying to you if when I talked to Albert Pujols or, or some other player who I never had any previous connection with, next thing you know, we're doing something together. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say, I didn't think that was cool. Like, I think that is freaking awesome. But before Albert Pujols, when you're looking at the people who you do know and the people who you talk to or create videos with, you're like, wow, this is really cool. But somehow, it, it as long as you work hard, it always seems to get better. And mm -hmm. it, it's just so crazy to think about that. So you worked with so many different people. And, and I bring this up because this isn't just, you're not looking at a roster and you're picking people out or you're sending out 25 bands to every single person on the roster this is again relationships you are there's a certain specific type of person and personality who fits the mold for something that you did and and that talks a lot about kind of like your mission statement and and and, and the branding side of it too so so what kind of went behind that and and i see it and i think it's amazing because when i think about baseball history and the cool players in baseball history <laughs> dude 99 percent of the times they were wearing your your mims bands and still do Right. The criteria that I had is I wanted them to have a um, a personality that was infectious, uh, a genuineness, uh, sincerity, and just all around good dudes. And there were a lot of guys that I turned away. I won't even name those guys that I turned away. I'm only going to focus on the guys that really hit the mark. And if if you look and have met any of my guys, all of them have one thing in common. They're good dudes period, to the core. And that's one of the things that I want everyone to truly understand. If you go, oh, my Barry, Barry's an unbelievable person. And I know that he has been ways with some people and how the media perceives him. But to the core of who he is as a person, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So that goes to all of my guys. Every single one of them, hand chosen. It's like, that is my mantra. No, you're not going to come to me and just get it because it looks swaggy. No, tell me something about it. Give me some historical perspective on who wore it. What do you know about this person? Go Google this person. It's, a, it's an educational tool for this generation because 
If you talk about Eric, can you imagine Eric Davis in New York? Are you kidding? Think about it. Yeah, yeah. Especially this day and age, the dude probably have a million followers on social media. Like cameras following him everywhere. Every probably uh, uh, people wanted a ton of interviews. So w- w- even when I speak to him to this to this day, those are the things that we talk about. He says, "Man, James, the roster that you had, dude, and the quality of person, dude, it's unmatched." So again, traits that I exhibit are things that I look for in others. Yes, and and check this out, right? So you're a really good, dude. I know that all the all the guys you work with know that, and. It, very often and and I'm I don't I try not to have my guard up all the time but you never know people you come across especially in sports it's right. like they always want something they always they always look at you they see your relationships and they will want something from you so so for anybody who's listening to this if they're trying to build something themselves or just be a good a good person in general what are some of those things that you kind of go down a, a, a checklist to make sure that that everything is good and like nothing kind of fishy. Cause again, like there's people out there who want to work with some of the guys who you worked with, but only want to, because it's going to make them X amount of dollars rather than like, Hey, you actually fit what I'm doing. So let's do it. You know, that's a, that's a, whew, that's an excellent question. Um, my foundation, my core guys that I go to for anything that I feel is not on the up and up. My go-to guys are dusty. Barry, Eric Davis, and Gary Sheffield. That's who I take any and everything to if I feel like it's a little, I'm not too sure. And one of the things that they always tell me is that, James, you did nothing to make us feel uncomfortable. You never asked us for anything. That's all that we want as players. We just want to be seen just as an everyday person. And that's exactly how you treated us. You weren't starstruck. You weren't any of those things. I think that's what garnered the respect. And another thing that garnered the respect is that the product wasn't where it was not supposed to be. It wasn't in someone's home uh, being hoard or sold for profit or anything like that. That's one of the things that Barry said. He said, I never saw my product where it was not supposed to be. So, I mean, when you're talking about the GOAT telling you that, you know that you're doing something really good. And he's, I mean, very, very astute. That's actually kind of leads me to the next question is that when you think about the young you, the young go-getter, entrepreneur, just a good dude approaching Dusty Baker, and then you think about all these guys who you've worked with and have great relationships with, did you envision all that type of stuff happening? Like, like the relationships with the Barry Bonds, the Barry Larkins, the Gary Sheffields. And uh, what would you say, in your opinion, is the most rewarding about those relationships uh, that you have with them? Because like it is during their baseball career. It's after their baseball career. It's not like a two-year thing. Like, here you go. All right, thanks for wearing it. See you later. Like, <laughs> that's that's another thing, too, with, with companies these days. It's like you work with one company. They're like, all right, cool. Thank you for being part of this campaign. We'll see you later. And, right. and, and not like uh, they're shooting, shooting you text messages uh, a year later, seeing how you and your family are doing. So like, what, like, what's your take on that? Yep. That's one of the things they knew that it was a very close knit group of guys. They knew it wasn't, everyone wasn't wearing it. Baseball players, athletes, I think as a whole, they want to be unique. They don't want to see everyone with it. And that was always how I approached it. But every time they came into LA, I was there. We weren't just talking about baseball. We were just talking about life because we were around the same age. So our conversations were very, very similar uh, age wise, conversation wise, uh, away from the field. It was really like that good old you weren't just a number. You know, I mean, there's no relationships with these other companies. It's like they'll drop the product in your locker. Thank you for wearing it because you signed an agreement. That's how it went. This was word. This was you, me coming to Matthew and saying, hey, Matthew, my name is James Mims. I got a product that I would love for you to wear. And these are the reasons why. And you could do one of two things. You can be man about and say, I want to do it. Or you can tell me, well, I'll talk to my agent. Any player that said they were going to talk to their agent, I nixed them. Didn't want to deal with it. Yep. Dude. Oh, man. 
Yeah. See, this is where we're so similar in so many different areas, but this is just another one of those things where it's just like, just the, the, I guess it's kind of being personable with people and, and one-on-one, you know, and, and actually looking out for somebody else's best interest. Uh, I think yep. it's just so important. Wow. So crazy. So at the top of this, I was, I was saying how it's going to be such a history lesson with the baseball in the background, but I think even more so, uh, <laughs> just like an entrepreneur, just, just the correct approach in, in, in business and just in relationships and stuff like that. So you're dishing some crazy knowledge. And I've had on the founders of, of, of super coffee, uh, my man, Mosh and, and who's one of the best luxury sneaker artists in the world. And, uh, Anthony Ambrosini from custom cleats and like just innovators. So I'm just trying to bring you guys some of the most innovative people that I know and just share with you their stories. And, and I trust them. And, and similar to you with like the roster of people, it's the same thing that goes for this man. Like I, I try to shed as much light as possible on people who I know personally who are great for baseball, but more so just great people who, who just have the best intentions out there. So, uh, yeah, there's a reason everybody, while I'm, while I'm bringing you James Mims and dude, like you are just, again, dishing so much knowledge. So this is just so awesome. So let's, uh, let's talk about some of the fun stories, man. We, okay. we see on your social media pages that there's just so many different players who, who you've uh, worked with and, and people who post pictures and stuff. So what are some of the cooler experiences that you've had, whether it's uh, uh, working with the player or it's uh, a text message or a photo that you've gotten uh, unexpectedly that you're like, oh, wow, that's like that's cool. Uh, so and so is wearing the Mims band, but it's not even somebody that who actually uh, you created it for because that's happened before in the past, too. Yeah, yeah, it has. Um, it, I mean, that's funny that you say that because the players, that was their way of letting me know that they wanted the bands. And, and, and the close, the one that sticks out the most was Rajay Davis. Uh, at the time, he was with the Tigers. And I had um, Austin Jackson and I had Tory Hunter. Rajay wanted them so bad, he was wearing Austin Jackson. Mims fans. I mean, I would watch the games and then all of a sudden I'm thinking, is this guy sending me a subliminal message? Like, what is he saying here? <laughs> so uh, they come into Anaheim and Austin calls me. He said, he said, hey, James, I got, you know, someone that wants uh, the bands. I was like, well, who? And I knew who it was, right? He was like, Roger. I said, well, tell me about him. He said, dude, he's an unbelievable dude. So he gave me the, all the qualities and things that I look for in the guy. So I met Rajay and he became one of a uh, part of the family. And I mean, he rocked them from the time Detroit, every stop. That's where you, that's what you saw Rajay. Even with this historical home run, you see it, he's around the bases and he's got the bands on. So that's a cool little story. And I, that's something that I couldn't believe that another grown major league baseball player would do. But that told me a lot about him as a person. He's he's awesome, as you know. And I kid you not, I was with him actually the day that he got his uh, Father's Day. Oh. Bands, man, the, the light blues. I was literally with him as he was opening it inside the clubhouse. And yeah, dude, he was, he, yeah, yeah, he was so excited, man. Like just the look on his face, like you said, they just turn into little kids when they get these things and. Same thing with Josh Harrison too. Like he was, he was stoked also over at City Field when Josh was over with the Pirates. It's just so cool. But yeah, it's so crazy that that was the example that you brought up because that was the first one in my mind, and it might have actually been one of the first times that I saw uh, an unveiling. I guess you kind of say in person, right. where it's just like, man, like you hear the uh, you hear it come out of the plastic, and and you just see the smile. <laughs> I got a smile on my face right now just thinking about it. Man, that is, I didn't know that. I had no yeah. clue. And, and, and it's funny. I knew exactly. I knew I sent them to Yankee Stadium. Uh, and I was hoping that they would get there because Yankee Stadium is like Fort Knox. I was just hoping they'd find him, make their way there. And when I saw him take his at bat and he had his dad on his wristbands, dude, he sent me a message. I think I still have it in one of my phones of how unbelievable happy he was. And that was something innovative that no one has ever done. I'd made Mother's Day bands, Father Day bands, Jackie Robinson Day, Roberto Clemente. All of those things are out there uh, for player 
player issues only. But to go back to your original question about something that I received from a player, and I was just talking to Scooter Jeanette literally maybe 30 oh, yeah. minutes before we came on. Scooter Jeanette, shout out to Scooter. He's, he's probably listening man. to this. I love Scooter. Man. He... And Austin Jackson. I got to give him a shout out too because oh, he actually Austin. might be listening to this also. also. He's one of the – one of the coolest dudes I ever met in baseball, and I uh, just messaged with him last week. And I love Austin Jackson, man. He uh, he he was one of the first guys who helped start my career in this. So I give a lot of credit to him for being wow. a cool dude. Always, yeah, yeah. Back okay. when he was in Double A Trenton. So yeah, really? all these yeah, all these names that you're saying, man. I, I I'm loving this. Man, Scooter gifted me. I don't know how long it's been now. Maybe four or five years with a. Uh, on Jackie Robinson Day in Los Angeles, he gifted me a Jackie Robinson, a number 42 jersey, Cincinnati Reds. Whoa. It was a whoa moment. I mean, I get emotional just thinking about it now because in my 37 years, that's the first time that I've ever received anything like that. Mind-blowing. Yeah, for sure. And 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 for everybody who's unaware, that 42 jersey, they, they wear it once or, or for a series only once a year. So right. like that's, that's something that's special to Scooter. So yeah, that speaks volumes about, about you as a person, but also obviously about Scooter as well. But that's, that's, that's pretty cool, man. So do you have that in a frame or in a man cave somewhere stored special where you got it? I have it stored. I haven't put it in a frame yet, but I am. Um, I, I, I just have to, and the funny thing about it, Scooter was hurt. So Every player on the Reds team signed it except for him. So I have to now send it to him for him to sign it. Okay. All right. And yep. everybody listening to this, uh, this is also something important to take note too, is that Scooter Jeanette played 2000, like 2010 area, right? So mm -hmm. if you've been doing this for 38 years at the time of this recording. <laughs> so that's, who knows how many years. You don't ask people for anything. Like you, you do not expect people for anything from anybody. That's another way to to stay in this as long as you have, and mm -hmm. and that's again something that I know from experience too. Like just have good relationships. You should just be happy with being able to call somebody a friend. Like it doesn't have to right. be like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be friends with that person, or I'm gonna try to do something with that baseball player so I can get that from him. It's just like, dude, just just it's a it's a common theme throughout the recording of this. Just be a good dude. Who who it's else you got on the uh, like that comes off off the top of your head? I love Barry Larkin, and I also right. love Gary Sheffield. So it might be a little selfish of me to ask for one of those stories from a mm -hmm. one of those guys. But uh, again, I know that there's a lot of great baseball players uh, that that you've done stuff with. But uh, yes, Gary got Sheffield there? is uh, I've known him since he was 19. His rookie year with the Milwaukee Brewers, he and I used to speak every single night after games he would call me i mean there were things that were happening um you know that were happening on the field i remember his first at bat against roger clemens he was i mean there were so many stories that would that he and i had shared and at that moment and then during those times they were trying to portray him so, like something that he wasn't like the gary Sheffield that you see now that was a Gary Sheffield then. He, he, he's the same person, always upfront and honest. If you ask him a question, he's going to give you the honest answer. And I remember there was an incident where um, a pitcher threw at him. And he was not happy about his teammate not taking up for him. So and I think what struck me was that was kind of odd is that you would think that Robin Yao, who came up at 19 years old, because Hank Aaron took him under his wing, that Robin Yao would do the same thing for Chef. And it didn't happen. So he was just kind of a 19 year old out there like on his own. And he wasn't happy about it. And he wasn't happy about the fact that because he was outspoken, because people were asking me questions. There's this, mis you know, Talking about how he would throw balls away. Those things never happen. Yeah. And, so, and going, you, you saw it. I don't mean to cut you off, but using that uh -huh. example, right, with, with Yount, where, like, he was a great player, obviously a Hall of Famer, but that's the type of thing that I would say happens more often 
in the minors, not the majors, right? So the minors, if you get into a fight, you find out who your real friends are because there's a good chance that somebody's not going to be sticking up for you. But when you get to the majors, when it comes to showing that leadership or showing, hey, I got your back, that's right. I, that that's when it kind of it means so much more with who's sticking up for you. Exactly. And the pitcher, I mean, you have to retaliate as a pitcher. You see one of your guys getting dusted, you got to let them know, okay, you're not going to get comfortable at the plate either. You know, that's baseball. That's just the that's just how baseball is. But just a just a giving person. Um again, dude, I love my, Gary Sheffield. Oh my goodness, dude. He is so misunderstood. He is such a I mean, there's no words to describe him. And Barry Larkin is the most low key. You would never know he was in the Hall of Fame. The Barry Larkin I had as a rookie to the Barry Larkin now, it's the same guy. Just, just the same dude. Easy to talk to, always has time. He's just a laid back guy. So the two guys that you picked out, funny they're in my arsenal, but they're they they are they are like individuals. That's again, those are the personality and traits and things that I look for. So those two guys, stellar. It's almost like the the Mims Benz brand, it's like, all right, if you if you're a great individual, perfect. It's almost like the baseball is kind of an afterthought, but they just happen to be really good baseball players. There it is. Some current day players like Nolan Arenado. I know that he was rocking them. Uh, Billy mm-hmm. Hamilton, Todd Frazier, mm-hmm. a bunch of different guys. So now taking it to some of the more current players. I know we had mentioned Scooter Jeanette briefly and, and Davis, but mm-hmm. like some of the current players and some of the bigger names, um, does it? Like, does it still feel the same when you turn on a baseball game and you see these guys wearing wearing the Mims bands? It does. I think one of the one of the biggest. This is when it really hit me. Uh, Dusty was managing the Cincinnati Reds. He was in L.A. and I was because I was trying to bridge a gap. There was a gap. There was a lull there because after Gary Sheffield, it was dormant for a little while. So I'm walking in the clubhouse. And um, I told Dust, I said, hey, man, I'm going to do, um, I got to bridge this gap. Like, who do you think would would wear them? And he said, Brandon Phillips. I was like, really? Like, he said, yeah. So I go up to Brandon Phillips. And I introduce myself. And he's in his cubicle and he turns around. He said, you're the dude? I was like, yeah. <laughs> he said, man, I have been looking for you for years. I was like, really? He said, man. Barry Larkin was my favorite player. I wanted the wristbands that Barry Larkin had. I was like, well, I'm the guy. And he just stood there like he 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 was just like, you're the guy. I'm like, yeah, like what were you expecting? Yeah, I didn't know what to say. Like, and I said, yeah, I'm the dude. So he was the one that put the product back on the on the scene i mean oh my goodness so from him it went to troy tulowitzki it went from troy tulowitzki to nolan arenado it went from nolan i mean it just kept going and going and then josh harrison is a second generation men's man wearer because his uncle john t-bone shelby was one of my guys back with the dodgers so he knew the product when he was a kid. So it went from, I mean, it just kept going and going and going. And again, quality people, Tory Hunter, Austin Jackson, Rajay Davis, crazy old Todd Frazier, who knew about him when he was a kid. And he kept bugging Eric Davis in spring training every year. Man, when are you going to have your guy come out here big in my wristbands? And he was like, I'll get him, I'll get him, I'll get him. So, and then when Todd had him, he took it to a whole nother level. So it, it just kept going and going and going and going. And just as it was getting some momentum, then the Players Association came along and did what they did. So, I mean, just as it was starting to excel. So I'm saying all that again to say to the audience is that even with all the things that have happened, even when it was stalled for a moment, I never quit. And the players never quit on me. See, I was able now to go back and have players speak up for me. So that that blew me away right there, Matthew. When they stood up for me during that period of time, 
that humbled the hell out of me. Excuse my French, but that really made me sit back on my heels and say, man, I knew I was doing the right thing because players just don't do that. They don't do it. They're going to go sit in their corner, let whatever happens happen. That's not my business. Not my guys. Not Eric Davis, Gary Sheffield, Scooter Jeanette, Josh Harrison. All of them were quoted. Yeah, no, talk about that's probably one of the biggest compliments that you could ever get and, and, and something that you didn't even ask for. It's just, it's just because of the good nature and because of the people who you surround yourself with and who you associate yourself with. And yeah, wow, dude, man. All right, so out of out of all these uh, players who've worn them and, and 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 the Mims bands that you've sent to all the players, how many of them have you kept for yourself? And and I saw that you have a binder of them. How many of them do you have yourself? Do you create a duplicate of of every I guess every single item that you do send out so that you have a copy of it always? And do you have a lot of like game used ones like your own kind of? mini james mims museum going on and not in like a uh i know you're a super humble dude and i know not in a and like a i'm the man i have uh what do you call those things uh uh shoot i'm uh like uh where they have the candles and stuff like and you, you oh, pray to uh, it. Uh, a mantle yeah like a mantle but um i'm blanking on the word right now uh, it's gonna come to me it's gonna come okay. to me I know you don't have one of those. I know you don't have a painting on your ceiling of yourself, but like, do you have kind of that kind of like cool memento type thing going on of just your stuff? I do. Cool. I do. Awesome, um, awesome. I love it. And, 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 it, and again, it just hit me maybe about four or five years ago that I better. When you're in it, Matthew, you don't think this is what I can tell you. I didn't know the impact of the product until social media and until this tops project when i see it, it, it it's going to be part of my documentary i'm going to post letters of the impact that it had on grown men's childhood it blows me away to this day to think that that product had that kind of impact i had no idea because when you're in it you're just doing it and you're not thinking about who it's impacting. You know it's a quality product because of the guys who have said, yes, I want to wear it. But you're not thinking that, you know, kids are going out trying to create their own, make their own. Uh, Ryan Spielberg, uh, one of the broad color commentators for the, for the Rockies, he would tell me, man, he would go out and buy white wristbands and try to put himself on it because Steve Sachs was his favorite player wearing it. These are like stories that I, that, that, that continually have come to me. And he, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on one of the broadcasts for the um, Colorado Rockies. He did a special on the product. So again, when you're doing the right thing, you're doing the good things, you're doing, um, you're, 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 you're holding yourself to a standard that, um, that you're not going to do anything to disparage your reputation, your family's reputation or damage your relationship. Things come back tenfold. I just I, I I'm living proof. Thirty something years later, here I am having a conversation with you about a product that you saw as a kid, the Tops Project, documentary, Major League Baseball Network. I, I mean, I have my own Tops card. The last card that I created was a Tops card of what I wanted to do with Tops 37 years ago. And now I have my own Tops card with my own Mims band. Me on it. I mean, come what really? <laughs> yeah. And I and, and my players talked me into it. I didn't want to do it. They were like, man, you're the brand. You got to do it. You got to do it. And I was like, no, I can't. And Oop, you have to do it. And I did it. That's what I was saying, man. You're such a humble dude. So I, I know it's kind of hard for you to kind of even answer that question. Or do you keep a lot of these for yourself and everything? And, and, and yeah, no, it, Thank you for sharing that too, because like, dude, that, that it's it's just so nuts and it blows my mind. And and so here we are. It's like there's people always trying to create stuff, always trying to evolve. And you're not sitting there just like, hey, I, I have this one thing. I'm gonna keep on doing it as is. Like again, like you're having the variations, like the Mother's Day, the Father's Day, all these different types of ones, right? 
And then you're also, you even mentioned yourself, social media. So you got this social media aspect to it. And now, depending upon whenever it is that you're listening to this, you got the podcast too. So you're creating this stuff. It's just like, and again, you could be sitting at home on your couch, just chilling out, thinking about the good old days, but you're just consistently growing and consistently getting better. And it doesn't matter what you did in the past. You're you're so present and so in the future that like you're still changing the game and evolving. So just kind of go into this podcast and and what we could expect as 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 viewers, as listeners, as as fans of yours uh, to come down in the uh, come down in the pipe. There are a lot of things that um, the podcast that you mentioned. I feel like I just have something to say that people may have forgotten about. Like um, people don't know that Gary Reed has hit over four hundred. Uh, he led the league in hitting over four hundred. I mean, think about that. I don't care what league you're in. You hit four hundred. That means you can rake, but no one knows that. And it's, never <laughs> it's never going to happen again. It's not going to happen, but no one talks about it, right? And then I want to talk to um, Ricky Jordan. Ricky Jordan had something happen to him in Philadelphia. He was like their starting first baseman. And then all of a sudden, they get John Crook, and, and Ricky's not playing anymore. And I, like, I want to know why. Like, what happened? So those are the types of things I want to unveil. And it's really going to be about the players off of the field. It's not going to, it's going to have very little to do with on the field. So I want to do that. And then there are things that I can't really speak on in depth, but I can say this. It's going to be mind blowing. And I'm not trying to throw out a teaser or anything like that. Truly. Like I can't, I can't really expand on it. Um, but that's going to happen. And then the documentary piece is something that has been in the works for a while. It's just a matter of it landing in the right place. But from an historical perspective, um, my lineage in baseball is something that I really have never like talked about in depth. When I tell you that I'm not just a just a regular fan, I'm gonna give you a little a little tidbit. My I played Little League Baseball with Kurt Flood Jr. Right at the time when the whole case and thing was happening in the Supreme Court. So when you think about that, him being the first to test uh, baseball, um, and then you talk about my godfather, Jim Gillian, who was Jackie Robinson's roommate. Rookie of the Year with the Brooklyn Dodgers. The stories I heard about Mr. Robinson firsthand, not the Jackie Robinson on the field. I'm talking about Jackie Robinson, man. So when you think about those two first, I'm not saying that I'm in that same category, but what I know for a fact, though, Matthew, is that I am the first and only Black vendor in the history of baseball. Let that sit for a moment. That is crazy to think. And one person, and one person who withstood so many different trials and tribulations, never backed down, just kept on getting after it, kept on believing in himself, surrounded himself with great people, and was just out to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. There's a lot. Um, there are a lot of things that I want to do, and I feel like I'm 58 years old. My time is of the essence in order for me to really get out of this and for it to really go where I wanted it to go. So this tops platform has really allowed my story to be put out there. And I never wanted to be out front, but now that I'm out front, I want to be able to go and talk and tell my story to let anyone who is aspiring to do something that you have to stick to it and you have to believe it. You cannot waver. If they get nothing else out of this broadcast here, stick to your guns. It's a must. Because if you, if you, if you sell yourself short, what is that telling you? 
I just refused to do it. Because if it were about the money, Matthew, I have sold my soul some time ago. It's never been about, it's never been about that. It really was about these players having individual, um, being individuals. Everyone just see these guys as just so stoic and on the field. No, these guys have personalities, man. So that's what's going to come out in this in this podcast. You're going to get to see sides of these guys that you don't get to see. Yep. And and for everybody listening to this, you know that that's what this is a lot about too. So if you love this stuff, just picture it with James telling the story. He's he's a great storyteller, as you already know. But just 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 picture that type of the content that he's going to be putting out. So you guys got to go check it out, man. Again, at the time of this recording, uh, who knows uh, what you have or may already have listened to or have not listened to, but like I'm telling you guys, it is going to be awesome. And if you don't do that, well, guess what? There's a good chance that whether it's Cooperstown or you're walking around in Washington, D.C., hitting up some of these museums, you're probably going to see James there too. Yep. That's a good. I mean, you, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that you're putting a putting a face to uh, to the name with all this stuff, and and you're kind of welcoming it more a little bit now, like you said, because you're 58 years old. Like you said, time is of the essence, and 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 I started this off saying that this is going to be a history lesson for a lot of us, and I want to have you on because I just admire you so much, and and as much as I already knew you, I learned a lot of stuff about you today too. That I just have that much more respect for you, man. This is awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, I, I think again, um, you know, when we connected, there's so many similarities. It's and insane, dude. I feel like we're like it is. It's almost like I uh, actually kind of like similar to Dusty Baker, where it's like you f- almost feel like that uncle, that close friend, or and and you understand all this stuff too. Like, dude, I'm telling you guys, I would not have brought James onto this if I didn't believe him as a person and, and as what he's done for baseball and, and what he's done in business. It's a, hey, you are, you are a very rare individual, man. And I mean that with everything. I'm not blowing it. smoke up your ass. I'm being dead serious, man. Like I told you this on the phone the other day, I think about everybody who has come and gone and, and you have been a consistent since the day that we connected. Yeah. And I appreciate that, man. That means a lot that, um, my parents raised me well. Um, I stick to those core values and, I just believe and will continue to believe not only in myself, my guys, and the product. It, it's, 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 it's our time. And I'm going to bring all my guys along with me. It is our time because there's a lot of guys, 10 Hall of Famers, 10, seven covers of Sports Illustrated. I mean, who does that? I mean, this is like the Avengers right here. I'm not. I'm not trying to drop any nerdy type of a uh, Marvel uh, right. analogy or whatever. But this is literally the greatest of the greats. It's crazy. In the very first one, with the the cover of Sports Illustrated, was Joe Carter, and I'll never forget another great player. I'll never forget the call. Oh, oh unbelievable! In the person, he calls me. This is how cool he was. And I was <laughs> Sports Illustrated. Every kid was going to the store to go get a Sports Illustrated. He calls me and he says, James, I got a surprise for you. I'm thinking, okay, like, like what? Well, let me back up. There were two guys on the cover. There was Corey Snyder, Joe Carter. Both of them were my guys. Joe Carter was the only one that had the bands on. I'm gonna let you just sit on that for a moment. Now, there's a backstory to that, but we'll we'll I'll, I'll leave that. But Joe calls and he says, "James, you got to go get the Sports Illustrated in a couple of weeks, the Spring Training Edition." I was like, "Okay, like why?" He said, "Well, I'm on it." I was like, "Okay." I go pick it up. When I tell you, it's like, um, I can't even describe the feeling to see your product on the cover of Sports Illustrated, like front and center. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's when you're going to the store, you're going to the deli and you're picking up a bunch. You're clearing out the shelves. Exactly. And then after that, the next year, 
it was Benito Santiago. Then after that, it was Eric Davis. Then after that, it was Straw. Then after that, it was Barry twice. Then it was Ozzy. I mean. Oh, yeah. Ozzy, yeah this We are an hour into this, and you just said a couple of different names. Ozzy Smith, yeah, that's, that's another great one. Hey, you know what? Before before we end this, though, and go into the bonus content, which everybody just stick around for, for sure. Uh, can can we get one fun Jackie Robinson story that that may not be as as popular or, or as well known uh, for everybody listening to this? James is on the West Coast, and I'm right here in Stanford, Connecticut, where the Robinsons spent their later days and after Jackie's playing career. Uh, and and there's a lot of cool history about Jackie Robinson and his family around here in Stanford, Connecticut. If if anybody ends up taking a trip over here to check it out, but yeah, the can can uh. And this was the bang with the with the cool Jackie Robinson story. What you got? Because because again, this is this we're showing respect and 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 I think that this is a great way to to end and just kind of show your ties and and how long how you've been in this game and 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 how everybody, <laughs> dude, yeah, we're doing a part two at some point, but <laughs> right. I want to get the message across. And while we have this platform, man, we got to make the most of it. I agree. I think one of the things that um, that sticks out to me um, is that, and in, uh, in my Godfather's rookie year, obviously you had roommates, and Jackie Robinson chose my Godfather to roommate with him because he was a young black player coming up through the Negro leagues, no different than Mister Robinson, and he wanted to take him under his wing. And one of the things that that really sticks out to me, and it's not really a fun story, it's like a life story, because you're thinking about this is 1953 in Brooklyn. And he told my godfather that he would never allow anything to happen to him. He would com- he will always cover him. He would not leave him out here to his own understanding because this is a completely different world and now 53 so that's six years prior to jackie robinson breaking into baseball can you imagine a 25 year old who you're now roommates with the man who allowed an opportunity for you to get onto the field there weren't a whole lot of light stories that were being told because again, it was such turbulent times, even to the time that he came to Dodger Stadium for the um, 1972, it was his last appearance at Dodger Stadium. My godfather had to help him down the stairs because he was going blind. I mean, this man was 53 or 54 years old at that time. And if you look at any picture, you would swear, Matthew, that he was in the 70s or 80s. That's how much was on him. My godfather died at 49. So I didn't mean to bring a somber moment onto what we're talking about, but I wanted to leave everyone with, like, I don't think people really understand the immense pressure that any player at that time who was a black ball player, was under, but especially the first. So to think again that he took my godfather under his wing and made sure that he was fine, that's the story that I want everyone to like, I want to leave everyone with is that, hey, man, that's who he was as a person. Just, just, just a beautiful, solid individual and nothing like um like they're trying to depict him to be he was very matter of fact um very much he wasn't uh he was very much pro black he wasn't against anyone but he was pro black because of all the stuff that he stood for and that he took just as a man and it was just really really sad man i was about maybe 2 or 3 years away from possibly meeting him because my first Dodger Stadium clubhouse visit was like 1974. So that was just, I, I wouldn't have known what to say if I had had an opportunity to meet him. 
But the stories, man, there were very few light stories, I think, because everything that was happening at the time. I wish I could have shared something that was like made you laugh and see a different side of him. But I really can't think of one off the top of my head. That's the one that sticks with me the most. No, I appreciate you sharing that and, and just kind of opening up about that. And and also, too, I think if if we learned anything today outside of everything that we talked about on the business side and 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 being a creator and everything and, and just relationships is that like you, you like their personalities, like they shine through you. They're you're, you're, you're a part of them mm-hmm. in a way, you know, that is still kind of sharing and continuing their message. And I think we did that today. You know, I think everybody yep. listening to this it respects and appreciates that, you know, and, and if they didn't know about your story, well, they know about it now. And if, if they did think that they knew a lot of it, well, <laughs> They definitely learned a thing or two in that aspect as well. So, dude, man, I, I appreciate you hopping on, man, and, and just yeah, sharing man, all this information, you. man. This, this is, I'm, I'm super appreciative of your time, and, and yeah, this is, uh, this is all great content. Where if you listen to it today, it's gonna be brand new. If you listen to it ten years from now, it's gonna be brand new. So, uh, between now and then, though, I'm sure a lot more players are gonna be wearing the Mims bands, and I want more people following you on social media so that they could check out the updates and see when all the podcast episodes come out. So where can everybody go to follow you? Cause I want everybody to definitely, definitely check you out on social media and, and just uh, experience some of the cool stuff that I've been able to just by knowing you and, and, and being friends together. I appreciate it. It's Mims bands with a Z. Uh, those are all the handles on both uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's, it's, it's really, really simple, um, easy to find. I hope they love the content. This uh, this month I was able to do, well, last month I was able to do Black History Month. I didn't have enough days you know, to give all, all the guys that have worn it, but I tried. Um, but it's a fun page. It's um, very factual, very lively. Um, you know, I enjoy... I do it on my own. I don't have anyone that I'm paying to do it because I, that's how I want to make sure that my content truly represents me. So that's where they can find me. Dude, my man, James Mims, dude. Thank you so much for being a good friend, a good dude, uh, definitely a role model. And, thank uh, you, dude. yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for hopping on. Keep swinging, brother. Oh, I am for sure. Sure.